the university and he's also the director of the Center for China Research there. Uh, Tim is the author of many fine books on, Mao's, on the Mao Zedong era, on Mao's works, he's translated Mao's writings. Uh, he is, I think, still the prevailing world authority on Deng Po, who is um, a leading party established party establishment, well, the party intellectual, you know, establishment intellectual, again, a, a, a term coined by Tim Tim and Carol Hamlin, and Carol Hamlin, Hamlin back in the 1980s, yeah. a very important concept that has the world. since actually, you know, has, has shaped the way that we think about Chinese intellectual, um, modern Chinese intellectual history and, you know, intellect, um, and intellectual politics. So, well, Tim is currently completing a book for Cambridge University Press on um, the history of modern Chinese thought. Would that be right? What's it, it, it no, that, yeah, I, I keep forgetting the title. It's the intellectual and modern Chinese history. Right. Intellectual modern Chinese history. The intellectual in, yes. The intellectual in modern Chinese history. Don't make any of the title. Right. Um, and I... Having heard Tim talk about this this book that he's been writing, I know that it's it's going to be a book like the others that he has written today, you know, one that's going to actually shape the way that we think about modern China. So without further ado, Tim, I'm Thank you very much. Telling and thank you for the middle now. of your holidays for coming out. The only thing I can, I can claim is that uh, the, you know, the weather's been cool, so it's not worth going to the beach just yet. <laughs> the, um, well, what I want to do today is uh, to invite you into my problem. Uh, the, uh, I set myself a task to um, uh, write a, a, a survey or an introduction at a high level of what in China's intellectuals have been up to in the long 20th century. So from 1895, you know, from Shimonoseki to the Beijing Olympics. Right, so you know, from terrible disaster to you know, Trump Trump and war, you know, the, you know, everything's wonderful, and, and uh, the uh, and uh, over that time, and, and what drove me with this is um, it, over the years I've done specialized work on Chinese intellectuals, but I was I trained with uh, Meryl Goldman. Uh, she wasn't my supervisor, but she was on my committee, and so we all know those of us dealing with modern China and Chinese intellectuals know about Meryl Goldman and her books, and. Uh, it, although I, she was a terribly wonderful uh, member of my committee and very uh, endlessly supportive and, and kind and would let me invite friends to conferences, um, I you know, really disagreed a lot with the way that she cast her books. And uh, I thought they were too simple. And at the same time, they were actually very well written and they weren't so much wrong as I thought, not complicated enough, if you like. Uh, but she was immensely successful. And, and, and widely influential. And I thought, right, at this stage of my career, I would like to do Merle Goldman right. I'd like to write the Tim Cheat book that would sell like Merle Goldman. Welcome to any meeting. And so, what would the... Uh, I is now unmuted. Good Lord. Is that the How very exciting. The, uh, um, I'm sorry, Merle. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, and, you know, when you go into what she's what she was doing, where she came from, you could see why it worked. And so that's this, the starting point. I thought, okay, I can't find a book that will give an intelligent reader, and to, with which I could not just sort of the intelligent general reader, but a fellow academic who's not a specialist in modern China or not a specialist on intellectual issues, um, that would be at least satisfactory to specialists. Um, might not tell them anything new, but uh, but it wouldn't be considered terribly disordered, but would invite broader conversation. Than, than invite. So the, the lighthearted version is to do more open right. The serious version is to say how to engage conversations outside of our sub, sub, sub special. And the way I put it is I wanted to write a book that um, is the sort of book that I would like to read about um, 20th century intellectuals in the Middle East or in South Asia. Something that someone who knows about it can tell me, but you know, in a, a, a more of a uh, not killing me with jargon and specialized stuff. So, so my the, the, this this is an effort 
that started as, you know, I say, well, okay, then that's sort of a textbook, it's sort of a, a, you know, there's a place for that and everything. But the second part of the project came in with the Levinson discussions, the Levinson group. And so Gloria and I have been um, part of some conversations over the last few years with some senior colleagues about the nature of historical narrative and also the nature of contemporary China studies. And the, for those of you in the China field, everyone knows Joseph Levinson and Confucian China and its modern fate, which was the seminal work. It came out actually in the late 1950s and early 1960s in three volumes. And it has been nothing but argued about ever since. Uh, and, and the short version of the historiography of contemporary China studies from the 1950s to now uh, is um, that the very big one is that in the 50s and early 60s, they were some, like uh, Joseph Levinson, were not afraid to write the big story. And they had a grand narrative. And this was China from being a world to being a part of the world, from Tian Sha to Guotian, right? The, uh, you know, Confucian China to this modern world, and what did it mean? And he did this marvelous uh, way of doing it. And then for the next 30 years, we did nothing but criticize it and with specialized studies showed in chapter and verse places where he was wrong. And you know what? He was wrong in these various places. And detailed work was very good, except that about, some of us 10 years ago, some of us later, you know, recently said, you know, we've got every little bit right, but no, we don't know how to put the puzzles back together again. You know, we don't, we, what is the grand narrative? So this rather more uh, challenging and advanced historiographical, methodological, conceptual, and philosophical issue underwrites this attempt to write something readable uh, that might help orient uh, how we look at uh, Chinese intellectuals. So what I want to invite you today is to walk with me briefly uh, through what I did. Uh, and I've, I've written a full draft of it, and I, I finished it weeks ago, just literally weeks ago. And you know, it's often being reviewed, so there's plenty of time to um, reconsider. <laughs> so this, you know, uh, but what I hope that might be of interest to you is we all in our work have our specialized work and our, our attempts to speak across. And so I'm not just talking about the general public, but how do we speak to our colleagues who aren't in our sub -zone? And whether it's China, Japan, China, Asia, China, Australia, you know, or it's literary versus political science. And so the last week, context of this thing is I been working with colleagues for a number of years on thinking about Chinese thought. <laughs> the, uh, and we had that, that workshop in, uh, in, in, in Vancouver in 2011. I got all my friends, very brilliant people, and, and uh, to, uh, get together and um, the, uh, uh, some were sinologists, some were liter uh, critical theory folks, and some were uh, political theory, law, and they couldn't talk to each other. Found each other boring. You know, they, out of sort of friendship to me, they sort of tried to pay attention in front of people, you know. You know and I thought, you know, so the, the effort to speak outside our sub sub discipline is not just a popularization in the local bookshop, but it's uh, how do we operate as a university. So those are the sort of the backgrounds of it. So, okay, so you've got this big this big problem, right? And uh, is um and the, the Levinson challenge was can we write something of the same scope or size? Don't have to have a single overarching meta-narrative, but what, what do we have? And, and remember that even when we do our little bits, we of course have a meta-narrative. <coughs> right? Gloria, in the Sinology field, Gloria's more theoretically articulated uh, than, than many of us. And uh, so we, we and, and, and with greater or lesser grace, we submit to admitting that, you know, yes, we have a meta-narrative. The, uh, uh, and this discussion group with the Levinson group, we reflect on using that as a kickoff point. And very quickly, this is with the Ye Wenxin at Berkeley, Mark Elliott at Harvard, Madeline Yue Dong at Seattle, uh, and um, the, uh, the University of Washington. Uh, very quickly, it leads to this question of meta narrative, or can we write abroad? What is the broad story about modern Chinese history? And, and, but then we get to can we? Should we? What are we on about? If we, do we even need to be doing this? So all good things. Right. So Merle Goldman's, her, her model was Russian refuseniks with Chinese characteristics. They were looking for Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn with chopsticks. 
The, um, and, and, and it's not that that was a bad thing, because in the Cold War, the, the pre-war shaped our view of the 20th century, the uh, uh, second half of the 20th century, World War II, Cold War, War on Terror. And, and the kinds of questions and the things we were looking for changed. You know, just broadly, and that shapes Australia, Canada, United States, as, as, as well as China, to the degree that wasn't doing this. Uh, one of the wonderful scholars on this sort of reflexive question, the sociologist Richard Madsen, and so his book, uh, being, an, he, being an American, is, is called China and American Dream. It came out, I think, in the mid-90s. But he, it, 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 here's a couple of things he said that I think we might all find sort of relevant. He says, whether it's Americans, Chinese, Australians, whatever, he says, we are members of, uh, members of all these societies are now faithfully becoming engaged with a vast, divergent, global political set of economic trends that benefit some, disadvantage others, and my favorite part, confused almost all of us. Mm -hmm. And Madsen characterizes this new world in which we have no choice but to live in by three trends. The internationalization of capital, the professionalization of management, and a third across the globe. So that's your world is flat stuff. And a third, a resulting reaction to that, a global trend towards particularism and identity in the face of these homogenized tendencies. And I think that is the bigger picture. And um, so then the question is, given uh, all these problems, Goldman has her views and other people have their views, um, why bother? You know, the, uh, and, and, and if we think about the checkered history of images of China, from Edgar Snow, uh, lionizing Mao in 1937 as the Lincoln-esque figure, to John and Holiday, John Wong, John and Holiday demonizing him as the, you know, the, you know, the um, Boris Badenov in uh, uh, 2005. You know, can we do this? And so I am of the school of thought that believes we can do something, and that there are tools for finding and telling a reliable and useful story. You will note that I did not say true, right? But a reliable and useful story, and uh, so, and I am essentially an academic historian. And so I'm using sort of basic, you know, it's not, I've not got any new tricky bits to do. So the question is, how do we write the history of modern Chinese intellectual life, and to what end? And the whole review of Goldman and all that is to say, it's hard to avoid a pleasing arc to our narratives. That it's natural and a successful writer makes a pleasing arc to a narrative. And the problem is, that that comes at a cost. And I can go through the literature review with uh, Jerome Breed, who does a wonderful book on the pre-49, and Hao Zedong, a lovely sociological one, and post-49. And uh, you know, even uh, Edmund K. Fung does a interesting uh, approach of uh, one particular reading of intellectual modern life, and all these lovely things. And Jonathan Spence did a lovely one, uh, Gate of Heavenly Peace. And his purpose there was to look at revolution, the experience of revolution. Or Liu Xun, uh, I think it was Nancy Chao Liu Xun and Ding Ling. I think so. And it's, though he starts with that Chu Jun, it's all very nice. Um, so, to what I want to say, for me, methodologically, is the historian's dilemma. We end up telling the story that makes sense to us and to our readership. And this is not a bad thing. We need to do it to some degree. Otherwise, we are boring or confusing to our readers and ourselves, or both. But this focus, this narrative closure, comes at the danger of misconstruing those we seek to understand. So I call that the historian's dilemma. And what's the solution? How can we, the question is, the dilemma is, how can we protect against the urge to create a satisfying narrative without leaving things chaotic or just more information, more and more information? So that's the really fundamental question. And I, I'm sure we all deal with it in our specialities in, in, in our own ways. So, for me, for this book, for this project, what? Uh, 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 how, uh, so the answer, my answer is to make our schema conscious, to make the framework of our narrative self-conscious, so that at least we, knowing it, make a choice about what we're doing, and then and the rest of it may not be avoidable. So my attempt, I would I would like to quote my solution, but I don't know if it works, uh, is to make a map provide a map in this book, and to um, model a method. And so the map 
our various lenses that help people who don't, that, who, who I assume are, it's intelligent people who are not particularly up on the details. So help me orient, you know, and, and map. So what happens over the 120 years? Can you give me some, you know, mountaintops so I can see where I am? Knowing that you're not describing absolutely everything. And uh, so I use uh, ideological moments, which set the question of the day and foregrounding awareness of social worlds or cultures of intellectual life, which are radically disjunctive and break things up. And then to go against that is enduring, you're doing something back there, there you go, enduring, uh, uh, enduring ideas. So if the breaking up is gonna do more than just make things confusing or non-connected, at the end of the day, it's got to sort of tell us something, you know, come back to a narrative that might work. Or what does it do? So, the, uh, the effort in this book is to offer the general reader a narrative history of the efforts of Chinese intellectuals to contribute to their society over the 20th century, what they thought they were doing, and how it worked out. For the historian, it offers a methodological essay on narrative with examples, testing what happens to an historical narrative when a frame the focus on ideological moments, etc., breaks easy plot development. And finally, for the China specialist, I hope to offer some challenging interpretations of familiar figures and useful information on those parts of modern Chinese intellectual history that you may be less familiar with. Though I increasingly, and when sat in front of uh, specialist colleagues, feel less and less confident that I have anything new to tell you. Um, now, the guiding ideology for me is the what I call the Levinson and Collingwood question, which uh, uh, the, those of you in general intellectual history remember R.G. Collingwood uh, and the idea of history, and uh, Levinson uh, cites a chapter and verse. So an idea is an answer to a question and a denial of an alternative. So the simple version is, if we want to know what Liang Qichao meant by Minju, we have to know what he's answering, what was the question. So it's a simple thing to say, but I found it narratively a little difficult to kind of gin up, right? So the first of the lenses that I have, I've got ideological moments, social worlds, and enduring ideas. An ideological moment captures the intellectual world of a time and place, including the key issue of the day, the cultural order, language of debate. This, for historians, it's, it's context, right? The competing solutions, the notable speakers and actors, right? The ideological moments are shaped by the dominant question that engages a generation, uh, and older and younger generations can be in that sort of generation, the moment. That's why I use moment rather than generation. Um, ideological moments are the intellectual's experience of historical content, created from inherited problems and tools, facts of geography, economy, and contingent events. Right. And so uh, intellectual historians often talk about uh, communities of discourse or uh, intellectual communities or publics and so these these are all related so the obvious example is that um, uh, well I don't know if it's true in Australia between uh, uh, Abbott's uh, crew you know the liberals and labor but in the United States you would say Republicans and Democrats are in the same community of political discourse they just they agree on the questions they just disagree on the answers they don't know what to do um, so so what, I'm, what we're looking for is what helps us make sense of the experience of Chinese intellectuals. So ideological moments in the book, I use six. They're basically 20-year blocks. And you could cut them up differently. And my point is not to say these are either ideal types or in the world of forms, really what's there. And you, you know, data is just reflections of it. It's saying it's a lens. So let's just cut it up and see what that does. And so. In the six, the first thing I noticed was, boy, there were three kinds, uh, reform, revolution, and uh, I called it nation building, but I like alliteration, and Xi Jinping, as he's doing for so many of us in uh, party history, helping us, uh, the rejuvenation. So reform, revolution, and rejuvenation. And they don't repeat simply because they're not a, a preset pattern, but the first one is, uh, and, and, and each chapter I begin with a photo and, and, and an image, you know, a little, you know, my attempt in two paragraphs to be like Jonathan Spence, it's about all I can maintain. Um, you know, with some evocative little things. So one is Tokyo 1905. You know, what is reform? 
there, you know, Yang Chi Chao's hiding out and, and doing that. And of course, there's the shadow self of each piece. And the shadow self uh, is, of course, Sun Yat-sen and, and the radical revolutionaries who, you know, aren't allowed into the public realm of Qing Dynasty thought because they're not educated enough, right? So then 1925, it's revolution, you know, May 30th movement, got a lovely poster of that, it's lovely with imperialism and warlords and, and the workers shooting back. And um, the, you've got your, you've got, you know, the, you know, Sun Yat-sen revolution, soon to be picked up by Chiang Kai-shek, and then the communist flip side, Mao's being forced back into the countryside, so then Hunan, Peasant uprisings and so stuff. Uh, 1945, Chongqing. So 1905, 1925, 1945, Chongqing. Lovely photo of, of uh, uh, Mao and Jiang and, and the American ambassador standing there. I like that photo because they were doing the, uh, the negotiations in, in um, uh, uh, was it August, September, 45, you know, uh, uh, into October. And uh, it was important. Sorry? Yeah, double ten. Yeah, right. All that lovely stuff, and you know, of course, they load the ground each other stands on. And but what was lovely about it was the American ambassador. It was the Chinese Revolution. You couldn't do without the Americans. They didn't like it, but you had to deal with them. And of course, you know, it would have been better if I could Photoshop, you know, you know, a common term, or, you know, post common term agent in the background, you know, you know, putting money in both their pockets, right? Because right? Gung Joe Stalin, of course, supported both of them. Um, and uh, 65, 1965. I, I kind of use an image of, uh, one is uh, 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 Lin Biao's preface to the uh, Mao quotations, and the other is some sad traditional style of poetry from uh, Dong Tuo as a representative of uh, the two. Even, although it was all Mao, all party, all the time, there was these very important differences between faith Maoism and bureaucratic or uh, administrative Maoism. Uh, Beijing, 1965, 85, oh, 85, a dinner in Fuzhou, or Wang Roshui is trying to explain Western uh, social science concepts to Hu Jiwei. I happened to be at the dinner, it was mind boggling. Uh, the, uh, and then um, uh, uh, Shanghai, uh, uh, Fang Li Zhi, talking to students, you know, at Jiao Tong, you know, and uh, Fang Li, you know, they see as different responses to the Cultural Revolution and trying to do reform again. So, of course, Cultural Revolution period, that's all about revolution, then you're back into reform. And then nation building is the, the last one since '95, or you know, uh, after the sort of post Tiananmen government. And, and the middle bit is um, uh, it was 2006, with Chiang uh, Chung Chiang uh, uh, Chung sitting in Starbucks, and Liu uh, Shaobo, 2006, before they were in the coup, uh, or uh, back in the coup. Uh, the Liu uh, Shaobo, um, he wrote a little piece on his blog, enthusing about the internet and me, right? That, which was just lovely. Uh, and uh, so there you go. So there, there's these ideological moments. So it's radically trying to put our focus back on the context, back on the questions of the day. What were the questions of the day as I've managed to conceive of them myself? So I'll try to do it quick, because we don't want to be here all day. Um, uh, 1905, how to save China? What kind of changes are needed to enable the world we grew up with to endure and prosper. Right? So, of course, very quickly, and then 1905 was just, you know, that was the midpoint between 1895 and 1915, and you can, you, can, you can move your dates and that's fine. What I'm saying is having a lens, what does that do for us, having these bigger focal points. And, of course, what happens very quickly is, what is to be saved? What is this China that is to be saved? And we know the traditional fair banking and kind of Thing, you know, impact and response, and I'm mindful that when you get to this level of clarity, it looks familiar. So, some bits of it does look familiar to the old narrative. And so they're saying, fine, we've got, we, we, we were, sh you know, we, we got defeated in the Sino-Japanese War. This is heartbreaking. You know, when I was teaching in America, it was very good. I said, we like the Mexican Navy sink the Seventh Fleet. There would be some soul searching in the United States, right? You know. Because you, you're used to thinking these people are secondary, and if they, if they you know, skunked you, then you know you're in, you're in trouble. Fine. Okay. And, you know, and so the idea of, you know, what is Chineseness and, and stuff, and, you know, when's the use of what words, right? You're still really using Hua and Zhonghua more than anything else at this point. Um, second one. So next snapshot, if you like. Uh, the revolutionary moment in the 20 teens, late teens and 20s. And, of course, this is what I call the John Fitzgerald question, right? How to awaken the Chinese people? 
in order to save himself from the clear and present danger of foreign domination and domestic misrule. Nation building, 1935 to 56, I like to jump to 1949. The, um, and the question there is how to build China, and there were three answers. The nationalists were really following Sunism, right? You know, and I think, I think one of the important things for me in reviewing this history, and I, I, you know, I, I read my Chinese, I'm doing my stuff, but I rely a lot on the uh, translations and secondary sources of colleagues because they're wonderful. And we don't read each other enough. You know, I mean, the, I mean, it's important to do our own primary research, but you need to do both. And um, so, uh, uh, you know, there's been a number of good studies uh, uh, on uh, the the impact of Sun system and, and uh, uh, Xinjiang, the uh, political tutelage. You know, that that is the system that both Mao and Chiang Kai-shek grew up with. You know, at that key point, they took it in different directions, but they they they, they you know both parties, as you know, are Leninist parties. And uh, um, the, the, the Nationalist Party and the Communist, Chinese Communists. So you got the Nationalist model, First Nation Building, the Communist model, uh, which had its own problems between urban and rural, and the Liberals. The Liberals really were there. They just lost. Because they, they, they're, they're, they're one, you know, the, the failure, it's not a particularly new insight, it's, you know, they couldn't deal with power. Right? You know, they, they, they asked to share power. And, you know, everything about them is good and right, except that. It was a terrible time of total war. And it's just hard to be a liberal in a time of total war. And you know, my students just said, where are all the nice Chinese by 1950? And I said, they've all been shot. You know, I mean, it's just, it was a terribly, terribly brutal environment. And one of the things of re resuscitating the environment is that, so when people read Yen and talks by Mao, right? They go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But we have no idea what their imaginary was, what their world was. You know, they were radically, uh, Shine had this thing, this old theory in the old, you know, uh, Chai Palm studies, was radical on freezing. It just meant if they shoot your family, you lose your job, and you're hungry, you'll be open to alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> and you might be open to alternatives where you could express how pissed off you are about this. And, and it gives you the opportunity to uh, kick some ass as well as think that you're contributing to something good, it might be terribly attractive. And who are we to say that we might not respond the same way if we had suffered the same depredation? Doesn't make it good, but it makes it at least understandable. So the fourth ideological period, so that, that one was um, how, to, how, to, um, how to build this new China, when, when China has been weak. Uh, so as of 56, I, I love my opening there for that chapter, I said, 1956, it had been going so well, <laughs> and then they managed to muff it. Uh, the, so, as you, the question starts in the late 50s, and by, by the uh, uh, eve of the Cultural Revolution, it is in, emphatically how to make socialism work. Because by that time period, liberalism has been erased off the public sphere uh, with the anti rights campaign. There is only one legitimate form of, of, of public language, and that's Maoism. Yet what I tried to show is it has internal diversity with the faith Maoism and bureaucratic Maoism as, as two, not the only varieties, but two obvious varieties. And so, you know, and we know, we always knew this one as was China's path. So the point is if you look at the various people writing at this time, that turns out to be the question they're answering, which is how to make socialism work. And even the, the last gasp of the liberals, all but a very few, we're trying to point out the way that a liberal approach to socialism, like a European style, uh, would, would, would be a good idea, but Mao well, wasn't having any of it. Um, so through the Cultural Revolution, great leap forward, and uh, you know, the, uh, when we, we look at the ideological moment after 1976 and into the 1980s, right, the, uh, it, can, it strikes me as reform-oriented, because you, know, you look at Ronald Austria, you know, Liu Binyan, they're not, they're, not they're not turfing out socialism, they're trying to fix it, right? And quite radically fix it, uh, with uh, um, 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 uh, alienation theory, uh, the young arcs, the, you know, and, and Deng Xiaoping is coming back, and you know, that is true restorationism, in that they want to go back to the full modernizations, which we will all remember, was announced not only by Joe and Mike, but by Mao in 1964. It's just that Mao changed his mind. Thought he'll have Cultural Revolution in between. So the older generation, this was just this was just restoration, right? You know, this was after Cromwell, bring back the king, 
right? You know, and, and the, the king being king part king organization. Uh, the uh, so and, and so the conversation that we see in public there, on the one hand, are either fixing China, the fixing socialism rather. So it was how to make socialism actually work. Then they, you try it out and you blow it. Now you're trying to repair it. And of course, there are sub conversations or, or counter discourses that are coming up. Uh, and so the whole cultural critique, I tend to read it now as part of a much more fundamental political critique. But it was just politically impossible to talk politics. So you just, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's like blaming the dog instead of your father, right? You know, so you blame Chinese culture because that's, you know, so that's the yellow earth and the uh, flesh on the uh, river allergy and stuff, and you know, boyan kind of things, saying, oh, you know, we're Chinese and we're just we're so pathetic, we're so awful. But what they really mean is our leaders are such sheets. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but you can't say that, right? So, um, so there you go. And then finally, you know, you make it through Tiananmen and, and, the, and then you get, you get the current dispensation, right? Which is, you know, really, and, and, and one of the things I try to do is, I try to keep Taiwan, I won't do it today, I try to keep Taiwan and the Kuomintang in conversation. And I try to radically do it from the start, right? By foregrounding Sunism. And I said, and I found a quote, you know, where Sun said, but, Power grows out of the barrel of the gun. I say, Mao is credited with these sayings, but he's only quoting. You know, he's, he's only the eldest president. He's not Big Mama Thornton. You know, he didn't write the song. <laughs> you know, thank you. He didn't write the song, you know, and, but he did get up and got up and dance. So there, there's a role to play, right? So soon as the connection with the, you know, this, this, it's a sibling rivalry. You know, it's a civil war and a sibling rivalry. And, Keeping in mind, you know, everything down to the, you know, there was a sit-in in 1990 in, in Taipei, you know, to push for presidential elections. And, you know, the contrast with Tiananmen, it couldn't be bigger. It was small, it was peaceful, it was successful. <laughs> you know, that Li Danghui promised that they had more open elections afterwards, you know, and invited them in, right, so, and, you know, versus the huge media event that was Tiananmen. So you come all the way down to, to the present period. And the last one, of course, and we all know this, this, is the world we live in, and that's the perils of prosperity. And so the question is how to deal with the consequences of reform, but really how to be a global power, how to be Shantri right? Kumar. Okay, so there you go. So they, the one last thing to keep up our ideological moments is that it's not the same as generations. Uh, because in any given ideological moment, you've got a younger generation that's coming into their political life, you have an older generation. So you can think of Liang Chi Chao was at the top of his game in the ideological moment circa 1905. But he's still around in 1925, but he sure as hell doesn't have the swing anymore. Right? Wang Wu Shui was, was a young Maoist in the Cultural Revolution. In fact, I'm not quite clear how much blood was on his hands. He's a lovely man in many ways. I think he tried not to do too many bad things, but he was on the left. But of course, in the next ideological moment, in the 80s of reform, he was powerfully important at a later age uh, in, in this, the last gasp of reform. Well, can't say last gasp anymore because here it's back again. We've got re reformed Xi Jinping Zhu, uh, coming up. So there you go. So, in other words, just using the case of Liang Qichao and Wolfrey saying how these lenses can help us remember it. So it breaks up. I don't look at one, an, an individual intellectual. So coherently, they're broken up by these prisons. This is a good thing or a bad thing. The, or Lu, I, I, I actually use Lu Xun. I have one section in the first group of uh, circa 1905 to 1910, 15. Uh, I, uh, some provincial intellectuals, because I they, we'll talk about it in a moment. Worlds of intellectual life, most of the metropolitan, provincial, and local, right? So people who are influential nationwide people who are influential locally, people who have the skills and abilities and read these other two sets of people, but have neither the, neither the pretensions nor the effect of going beyond their local school or their local district. You know, and they, it could be a village or it could be a community in Shanghai. You know, it's your fractal, le fractal levels that you're operating, right? Well, in 1911, Lin Xun was a provincial school teacher, right? Not that many years later, he was you know, the biggest uh, uh, metropolitan intellectual. So again, using these lenses as a way to keep in mind that you know, he wasn't always great. 
right? No one is. And uh, what does that do to us? Okay, so I'm very fond of the work of Thomas Bender, American and urban historian, intellectual historian, uh, a lovely little collection of essays called Intellect and Academic, and where he looks at the history of the great transformation in, in, in America from um, traditional communities of intellectual life to modern. And tradition, which he maintains, based in residence. You're, you're, you're the good and the great of a local city. He uses Albany, New York, capital of the state of New York, it's a provincial town. The, um, over to professional life, when you're a, you're a member of the American Historical Association, you know, or the, the British Sociological Studies Group, you know, right? And how does that change the nature of the knowledge you're producing and, and what constitutes proper knowledge? And so I thought, oh, this is terribly familiar to what we're doing. Listen to the way he explains that just men and women of ideas work within a social matrix that constitutes an audience or a public for them. Within this context, the social matrix, they seek legitimacy and are supplied with collective concepts, vocabularies of abundance, and the key questions that give shape to their work. These communities of discourse, which Bender calls uh, cultures of intellectual life, are historically constructed and held together by mutual attachments to a cluster of shared needs and intellectual purposes. And the killer says, they socialize the life of the mind and give institutional force to the paradigms that guide the creative intellect. They socialize the life of the mind, your imaginary, and they give institutional force to the paradigms that guide creative intellect. That's all we're really looking for. Right? So there you go. And so in China, in the concrete case, you go from a universe to these worlds. And the universe is the universe that Gloria Davis has described. And I've found the following slavishly for the last 10 years. And that's Sinophone discourse. So what it means to be reading and writing in Chinese. Uh, and that's not just a linguistic lexical item, and you've got translation studies here at, at uh, Monash, that is it, really good. Um, the, uh, it means what constitutes an argument? What are the problems? The, what matters? Right? And so the way you know you're coming out of a, a, a phone discourse, if you like, sound of a discourse, is if you translate it into another phone, it seems weird. So we know plenty of poor Chinese live with far too much of our English language work on China is translated into Chinese. And uh, not always the best work, and it's not always well translated. And you know, Chinese students tell me, it's inscrutable. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. It's in Chinese, and these sentences make sense, but the text doesn't really. And we sometimes, depending on the felicity of the translator, run into the same problems the other way around. So you have the universe of Chinese language, right? But below that, uh, in, you, you have the realities of the public sphere, right? So Sun Yat-sen could not write to Li Wong Zhang and have him pay attention, right? Because he, he, <coughs> he, he couldn't write well enough, and he wasn't an official, and he hadn't passed any sort of degree, and he was a half-breed. You know, in culture. He'd grown up in some island in the middle of the Pacific. It was awful. You know, and the and uh, the uh, and then then the whole world explodes with the wonderful you know Gutenberg Shanghai and the, the, the newspaper media and you know all that. You know, but then you get the directed public sphere that I maintain is born with Sun Yat-sen, built by the Kuomintang and perfected by the communists. Right? And. Uh, the, 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 so often the case is the difference between the nationalists and the communists, the nationalists often for better rather than worse, for less good at making you go, less, less good at running a Stalinist system. Uh, and uh, the, I regret to say that the concept of the directed public sphere is still applicable in China today. Under Jiang Zemin, sort of, you know, 10 years ago, I thought, well, maybe it's a thing in the past, it's, it's transitioning away, it's much more open now. No, I don't have any colleagues who would make that argument today. I think I'm on fairly firm ground there. Okay, so the world's below, and then what I end up doing is to say, start with metropolitan, provincial, and local, and then be mindful of cross-cutting worlds, popular culture, because an individual person, and we're beginning to get, I hope, a sense of where my, why it took me four years to get even this far is, once you map out this matrix, I don't know, how the hell do I do that without boring everyone to tears, right? But, you know, who sure had his home life, right? You know, the Anqi Chao, you know, Lu Xun, because most, so much of his life is in the public realm, you know, 
advocate of, of Bar Kok, but writes in Wenyan in his diary, right? And likes the Japanese. <laughs> you know, it's like in the time of anti-Japanese nationalism. Like, <sighs> okay, so popular culture, which points us to everyday life as a part of intellectual production, women's worlds, the segment of life of, of, of females, and, and what did revolution mean for, uh, uh, for, for, for women, for, you know, you think of Dinglings, Bisopi, and all kinds of things along the way. And finally, worlds of affinity, which is both ethnic identity and self-chosen identity, Buddhist, religious confusion, Christian, Iguan Dao, GLBT, I mean, you know, all these things are real. Okay, so you can see, and then it, it can get worse, but we will proceed briefly. Right, you can have social institutions, identity and social role. So you can think these all the ways that your question of the Chinese intellectual get broken up. Right? So you have social institutions like the Ashri, Daigaku, right? There weren't any Daigaku, any universities, you know, of this sort uh, uh, before the 1890s. And you have um, so intellectual identities, things like Trisha Funzi, right? The term only comes into common use in the 20s. And you have social roles like Gambu and uh, the, you know, the cadre, you know, what does it mean to be a cadre, right? That is a particular artifact of the 20th century, Okidoku. These terms obviously seem very abstract, uh, but they allow us to trace the relationship, and here's the pragmatic purpose, the relationship between educated elite and public institutions of knowledge. And over the 20th century, over all these changes, and to see how current relationships between intellectuals and public and public life have been created and developed now. Uh, Eddie Yu and Robert Colt, Eddie Yu is the conference here, doing wonderful work on, and the, the uh, buzzword in the business is uh, knowledge production. So if you're doing knowledge production studies, you're, um, you can get into certain journals. Uh, the, uh, I've learned to use the words, but I don't know if I always use them in the right place. Uh, the, uh, but I have young colleagues who say, no, you, you, you meant to have that there, Tim. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. They, um, but you know, joking aside, it's very important, right? So to, to ask, and this is a question I think that, like, for instance, Levinson did not ask, which was where was the social place of the texts and scholars that he was quoting? He knew, but he didn't seem particularly relevant to his sort of great chain of being kind of approach that he had with intellectual history. But what's the relationship between the educated person, the knowledge producer, and, and the institutions of the person? And so I gave you just very briefly some of those. It, are you writing to the Shu Yuan? Are you writing poetry to a fellow cognoscenti? Are you writing newspapers uh, in newspapers you know, in, the, in the whole lot of sense? Are you writing party party ideological tracts? Or you, so that, those are institutions of knowledge production. And so, well, follow the, when I talk about social identity things, you know, we have, we watch our educated elites going from Shirdai Fu and scholar officials to Jushu Banzu and writers, professionals, experts, and revolutionaries. Then they come back as Jushu Banzu Kambu and, and with cargo roles in the total state. And then, then they say, no, what the hell with that? We're Shueja in the, in, in the academy, right, you know? And then someone says, ah, oh, but I was Jushu Banzu again. And now today, it seems like they're all on the table. Because you can be a, a Gambu, you can be a Jewish government, Gambu, Pao Wei. You can be at Beida or Tsinghua and serve the government. Right? You know? And so it's, it's, and it's my hope that by the end of the book, those are richly available to the reader, saying, oh, so they're, they're pulling from this bit and they're pulling from that bit. You know, that it's not some kind of uniform Russian diffusion of Chinese characteristics. Well, there you go. And of course, obviously, the, the two themes that come up for this is one is the nature of the public arena, so this public sphere, direct public sphere later on, and also the issue of professionalization. If there's one thing that did strike me, and I was terribly resistant to any you know, unitary narrative, but it would be, in, in this one, the, the theme of professionalization of, public, of intellectual life uh, is so is suitably complicated, because it kind of rises up with medical associations and things in the 1910s in Shanghai, and they're going to be modern, and they're you're going to be, you know, you, you, it's, it's the kind of um, the educated person, almost a British model of, you know, the good and the great, we're going to take care of society by telling them what to do. Uh, and then it's crushed and sucked into the uh, cadre state, 
you know, the, 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 and, uh, and now it's back again with being an expert. So are you a culture-bearing Jishapunza? Or are you, you know, uh, 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 an urban planner? You know, a, a professional. What? Enduring idea tendons, uh, enduring ideas. So having broken up everything as much as I possibly can, broken all these things down, I, as I was writing, I thought, there's no story anymore. <laughs> you know? I thought, oh, that, now, I've now I discover what happens when you disconstruct the narrative, you have no narrative. <laughs> right? And I'm writing it, and I'm bored. Uh, so that, was, that was the summer of 2012. It ended badly. I, I, I crawled back to my classes and, and teaching and just thinking, perhaps this was a terrible idea. Thank God I'm tenured. The, uh, <laughs> The, uh, but you know how it is, this is why there are second children in families, you forget. You know, and you think, oh, well, it might, it might be nice. You know, and, uh, the, um, so I thought, well, the way to test it is to try to follow some core ideas. And this comes back to Ben Schwartz that we're moving on to, yeah. which is the problematique. And also another theory person I've come fond of is um, uh, Reinhard Kostner who works on the history of concepts. I do not speak German, but it sounds like, it looks like the Lichtgeschichte. <laughs> so, pardon my faux German. Um, but the, uh, and, and it, but it's, it's a wonderful methodology for getting at ideas and concepts. And so the difference between word, idea, and concept. So we all know uh, Ray Williams' key words, that's very good, and that's sort of most of the way over. Koslek is just a little more radical, a little more. Uh, and because concepts don't have to be expressed in the same word. So when I'm trying to follow three things, I just chose three that were relevant to, because you could follow any number of things, um, uh, that were relevant to my topic, which is the role of intellectuals in public life. So the three words was the people, Chineseness, which is ugly in English, uh, and um, democracy. I was so unhappy with Rob Bolton, the simplistic thing about democracy. I thought, I thought I'd better go up bloody well, see if I've done any better. Right? right? And so, in each chapter, I end with a reflection of where were these up to at this point. So, it's such a radically different ideological moment, with the table doing things. Is there, and what Kostelik argues is a concept is an idea that is fundamental enough but flexible enough. And he gives the word democracy in Europhone languages. And he says it includes Athenian polis and the expectations of the Enlightenment and early industrial society and postmodern, you know, globalized this and that. And he says a concept is robust enough to maintain coherence while being flexible enough to accommodate ser serious change and inflection. And, and I found that a terribly helpful uh, to, to chase these things. So, uh, and, I, and I do, you know, chase where these all are, and of course one of the things you end up doing, of course, you have to use the words. Right? And so one way to get at it is, you know, the words for the people, you know, what do you got? Chun, mm, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, but then, then it becomes rending, datum, right? You know, but then boring, you know, the thing, so you've got group, uh, mean common people. Mm -hmm. Ren is human. Uh, Ren mean is human people. Uh, uh, Dajung is masses. Uh, half of these words are Meiji, Koba. You know, the, the okay. words coming back. Yeah. You, you know, right, kind, yeah. uh, the, yeah, the, the, this, this, this marvelous circuit that goes on between Chinese and Japanese. They borrow the Chinese characters because it's like ancient Greece for Romans. And of course, then they improve it. <laughs> right? and then, then, but it's like Greece came back, you know, and I said, thank you very much, we'll have that back. And like, oh, that's, oh, that's cool, you know. And, 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 and it was a way for weird things to look familiar, right? So, you know, that Keizai, uh, uh, Shakai, become Jinji, and Shilhui, so ideas, modern ideas of society, and then, the, oh, Kakume, Gyotoni, right? So all the, 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 the Lydia Liu and others have done a number of people. Marvel studies of the importance of that. Okay, so, um, Ren, uh, Guomin, Shirin, Guomin is a citizen, Guomin is a different kind of citizen, Guomin is a nation state citizen, and Guomin is a public, public person. Um, 
uh, Xu Min, a uh, bourgeois or uh, city person, and other news for, for civil society stuff. So, okay, so then, you, and you can talk about the, then you do a little bit of psychological stuff and talk about the words and the, the weight of the characters and you know what they mean. But you also talk about what, did he, what was Liang Qijiao, and you, it forced me to come back to what's the question he's answering, mm -hmm. right? And so for for him, it's you know who, how come the West can mobilize their societies and we can't, mm -hmm. right? But you know by 1925, it's it, who are we serving, mm -hmm. right? And, and there was an unintended consequence famously articulated by Fred Wakeman in the uh, uh, Christ Autonomy, which is that they, the Lai Chi Chao's generation, articulated the truth as the locus of political authority or legitimacy, took away their old role, which was to advise the emperor. And, and the people didn't know that they were supposed to be advised by, by these intellectuals, so they handed away their job. And that was the price of autonomy, which was political estrangement. And I use that, my only, my, my, um, homage to Levinson is uh, the, uh, uh, I you know, Dung Tuo and the establishment of intellectuals paid the price of, of engagement. They got their political authority back, but of course it came with considerable political subservience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, so ideas about the people, Chineseness. So you know, what was the word for China? For the Chinese, what did people talk about? Wonderful bit, uh, Glory, one of her dual side projects was on uh, uh, um, Leon Chi Chao in, in, in Australia. It's fabulous. And the, 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 the reports of him, they talk about he's, he's war, he's one of us, right? But, and more importantly, he's Japanese. <laughs> he's not Hokey and he's not. Right, you know, this, 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 this grandee who's visiting Australia, he visited right at the Federation, 1900 to, to early 19, uh, 19, yeah, to early 1901. Um, yes. Are you speaking Cantonese? Yeah, Mandarin was a hallmark card, and this is why we didn't get a good position with the Pontryampa. Ah. We didn't really understand that Japanese spoke like that. Yeah. Isn't that Japanese? See, it's, it's, it's the language. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, um, so Chinese, and so I look at uh, Zhang Kaiyin, uh, uh, Zhang Mingling, and he wrote a lovely piece on Zhonghua Mingguo. You know, uh, 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 Zhonghua Mingguo. So he really did the initial ideal, um, philosophical work on Chinese identity. So it was Zhong Hua, so not Zhong Hua. Right? You know, and so it, it's, it, it's the four essence, the, the, the flower of right? uh, uh, And are Chinese, it, are they racial, are they cultural, are Manchu Chinese or not? And of course, Sunet Sen wrestles with these things and the five color flag, you know, whether Chinese means you're resident in the old Qing Dynasty area or you're Han, or act like Han. And basically, by mid-century, it's meant to look good, but it really means you, it's, it's what we always used to say about bringing women into the uh, in, into the academy, you know. Just as long as they act like men, it's no problem. Yeah. I can remember some of our senior colleagues saying, it's such a problem having these women here. Yeah. They said, I know, you say, it's, it's not like men, do they? You know? And he's like, you know, So the, the idea of including all the different you know, ethnicities in this new republic, but John Kahn, he was pretty straightforward about it. He said, no, they can't vote until they act Chinese. You know, until they act, uh, when they act like Han, they can vote. You know, so, okay, that's a clear answer. Right? But it's, a, it's an unresolved issue. So it's like the Ben Schwartz idea. These, what, uh, this, these concepts are problematiques. They, in fact, do meaningfully cross over ideological moments. But often, and so uh, we could do the same thing with democracy, you know, what happens. But, um, the, uh, but there's all kinds of misinterpretations, quote across the time periods, including very much our own in that. And uh, I am ambivalent about those because people misinterpret to the degree necessary to make it relevant. You know, so some of them are like, okay, right? But then then, then where then I'm back to my historian's dilemma. Where's where's my commitment to truth or accuracy? Right? So it's a and, and you know and what is the power of something? So I want to close with, so what did I get so far out of all this elaborate uh, uh, effort? One thing that didn't change was the will to serve the public good. It was all way boom, that, or at least their, their representation of themselves was, was that whether it's Yao Chu Ming, James Yin, you know, you know, Buddhist Confucian, Confucian Christian, revolutionary, so you know, 
they would all, if you asked them by senses, they'd say, well, this is the way home. Uh, this is for the good, for the public good. And uh, I, in fact, I wanted to call the book Serve the People and say, that's the theme of the 20th century. There's only three questions. What does it mean to serve? Who are the people? And who gets to do it? So they didn't like it. And, they, <laughs> and I'm a practical guy. I want to publish the book. I said, fine, it's your press. What do you want? A intellectual in modern Chinese history. I said, oh, that's a winner. <laughs> the, uh, they, the, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, so what I got out of all this is, you know, uh, four things. And uh, they, they border on bromides, but I think you get a sense, I try to both cast my questions as simply and clearly as they are, but try to give you a sense of how complicated it gets when you're trying to do it. Number one, be careful about making sense. Use something to inhibit your natural human urge to rush towards narrative closure. And if you don't want to use ideological moments and social worlds, then something else that will force our attention to the power of context and community and to the vagaries of interpretation across time, space, and culture. So in, in faux Buddhist side, I say you need to cultivate your historical mindfulness. <laughs> so cultivate your historical mindfulness. Second is treat these things as tools. These are not beautiful theories. You know, they are merely, at best, merely useful. So, um, look at the best ways to use these lenses, and for me, they, it's in concrete detail, detail, concrete detail, none of which you got today, and I apologize, because this is a methodological question. I have two versions of this lecture. One is I just start talking about Liang Chi Chao, Ding Ling, and Wang Shui and see how it goes. Um, but then they say, so what's an idea for moment? And uh, what was, you know, okay, so the best, these are craft tools, not beautiful means. Uh, and so the, hence the bulk of the book is there. Three, the interpretive richness of radical contextualizing. Uh, uh, this is the value of a carefully contextualized understanding of intellectual or their ideas or their conversation provides a surer reference for our contemporary issues. Uh, this is what I call the dialectic between getting, being true to what they are making and being true to what I need to know. Because a lot of who they were and what they were, I don't need to know that. Other than, I'm just curious. Uh, so we avoid misreading what democracy meant to the young Chichao on the one hand, but, uh, and perhaps using these lenses, sometimes see previously unnoticed, unnoticed continuities. We want to go back and say, how long have the Chinese talked about democracy? No one, wow, everybody is actually embarrassingly straightforward that the Shreja should do this, that educated people should do this, and uneducated people should wait for instructions. And boy, you get that down for them, yeah. right? The number of people who just say one man, one vote are remarkably few. And four, um, the, the, uh, this is the closest I get to a meta narrative. Concretely, on the content, content of intellectuals in modern Chinese history, what struck me the most, and this would be my inclination to make sense, is that good ideas do not necessarily win that is, prevail in public life. Rather, it is a case, as Philip Kuhn has argued in his lovely old piece on the origins of the typing vision, that it is the fit, the, the, the fit in the world of the imaginary, the fit of an idea, local or important, doesn't matter, or revived from somebody's idea of tradition, it's the fit of an idea with the social experience of a group that most determines whether that idea, for good or for ill, will prevent it. We'll play a role in public life and even dominate it. So it's fit rather than goodness that uh, guarantees reproductive success uh, of an idea, proposition, or way of thinking. So it is not a satisfying narrative of the search for freedom, the resistance to uh, bad government, you know, but it feels more real and I'm interested in meeting the person that they endure with tools that they, they may not see what I see, and that would be okay. Yeah. But that as a professional, what I brought to the table is sort of the introduction, so that they got oriented, because they didn't know where the May 4th movement was, and they didn't know quite when exactly, you know, communists came to power necessarily, or, you know, these things. So try to do that as painlessly as possible. Painlessly as possible. 
but then to suggest some lenses. So, there you go. What kind of worries does that leave you? Thank you very much. To survive, you know, I made the joke about being tenured, you know, to get your job, you don't need to put, you, put, you better not publish in the age, right? You be, it better be in the, you know, the journal of tenure. Yeah. Oh, you have to do both now? Well, the thing is, oh, you have to you publish in the age, great, but then you have to deal with all these people writing comments like, you should be fired, I can't believe my tax dollars pay for A pink girl like you. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And it's nice to know they're paying attention. The, uh, um, the, but to answer your question a bit, I, I, I would suggest that it is um, Bender's thing about the move from a community-based intellectual or educated person to a professional. That I think for, and Canada has the same thing, we're all dinged as professionals. And there's a, a radical distrust now of, of, of everything, right? And so they think, oh, you're just part of this wretched system. And you're not even amusing. I mean, you know, I know I'm being abused by Amazon, but at least I get my ha right? And so you're, you're boring and you're a professional, you're a wanker, right? So the, the go back to the flip over or treat the transition that Bender showed from a community-based person to a professional-based person, so maybe you need to go back to that side. And I think that in, in, in North America, you need to get your intellectuals 
outside, you, you need to go do social activism. You have to be, you know, stir, be a stirrer. You know, go out and organize people to do things. And so use your intellect to, to, uh, to, uh, if you, to mobilize people on something that you care about, that they care about, that you'll get them to, you know, make themselves pestilential to the government. That's the best I can say. But it's, it's not going to come out of the university. Well, it's difficult. I mean, I think, you know, we, we try it each in our own way to make our research so it's kind of, you know, just more central to, to, to that ideal, you know, of the humanity, sort of kind of be substantial engagement with the problems of, you know, of humanity, but it just, it's, it's just very hard because increasingly we're kind of writing for, um, you know, grand processes, you know, we're kind of just locked into these sort of Prefabricated silos, and then conceptual silos, and then trying to work them actually. But 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 what, what I would feel good about in if this project prompts questions to reflect on our own. Yeah. You know, and it's, at certain points I said, well, of course, you know, this is our, you know, I'm writing out of my ideological moment, mm -hmm. you know, not mine, the one I'm in. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's and so. You know, and it, it's a bit like the phenomenological, you know, philosophers. You're like, oh dear, it's turtles all the way down. You know, you know, where do I get my my my, my, my vantage point? And then the answer is you do in the dark. Okay. Um, any other questions? It's a lovely sunny day, and I think uh, you've suffered <laughs> enough, as they say. Enough. Just, just very yeah, could, could you please just email me the same things that you were going to email Carolyn? Um, oh, okay. a, a very interesting the, the history of concepts. So how, maybe if you have, if you can squish it into a minute or so, um, if you could talk a little bit more about the sort of methods that you use um, to take all that data of what words are being used at different mm -hmm. times and sort of track the uh, changing of these people and democracy and Chinese. -ness. Well, it's one thing I didn't talk about the method because it, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's standard shop, you know, intellectual history, you, it's close reading the text. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking for intertextuality, you're looking for the reference, you're looking at, uh, you're looking for, you start with the words, but sometimes it's the word that is there and isn't there, right? You know, and you say, well, here's, a, here's a, an essay that's talking about public participation, and the word democracy doesn't appear, or mean, or doesn't appear. So you're like, so what's up? Versus, oh, it's bristling with these things, you know, it's a, a maltext, and it's got nothing to do with democracy, but they use the words, you know, so, so that's the, the benefit of the Acosta, like, and then he's not. You know, but to separate words and concepts, the, the thing. So it's close reading of texts, and it's um, uh, chasing what I call performative definitions of words. So, which you, you, you can do very mechanically, and I have done mechanically, which is where are the parallels set up? They say, to be revolutionary is to be new, right? It is to be left. So you just tick them up, you know, and so where are the identities that are done, contrasts that are done. Jeff Rosserstrom did some nice stuff. We yeah. had a project on the keywords of the Chinese Revolution yeah. back in the 90s. Right. And that was in Indiana. <laughs> the, yeah. the, uh, so th that's the sort of thing. Um, others probably do it more sophisticatedly, but I tend to be pretty concrete. Well, there you go. And I'd be glad to send you or uh, make sure that uh, Glory has the, it, you know, it's, 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 it's just a working a draft of trying to I'll reflect on what your, uh, it's citations, and it has the citations. Because <laughs> uh, it, yeah. so it's got chapter and verse on Costa like a better. Great. All right. There you go. Trying to get you know, Train's running on time.